Welcome to the first lecture of MEC 4428, Advanced Dynamics. Today's objectives are to review the dynamics for a particular particle, uh, vector analysis, coordinate systems, Newtonian mechanics, and the concept of degrees of freedom, momentum, work, and energy, equilibrium and stability, to discuss so-called first integrals, and all of this is covered in the book by Barra in Chapter 1, Sections 1.1 through 1.8 and 1.12 for 1.13. The problem objective for today's lecture is given on page 79 as Problem 12. If we have a rod attached to two sliders moving in the, along the guide bars as shown here and here, what is the velocity of B when A is at 25 inches, forgive me for the the imperial unit, and moving down at 3 inches per second. The idea here is that if you have a bar linked between the two of these items, you should be able to determine how this is moving if you know how this is moving. In other words, this is all about kinematics. On page 80, problem 19, we can look and try to determine the equation of motion for the mass on the spring, and notice here that it's not just simply falling vertically, it's actually the mass is sitting on a on a spherical surface. Here we'll ignore friction for the time being and talk about the kinematics rather than the dynamics. Furthermore, page 85 in problem 48, mass m, say, is being acted upon a, by a force expressed in spherical coordinates by f, which is k theta divided by r times e theta. And we'll explain more about what e theta means later and find the integrals of motion for that situation. Here's the cartoon line. Hope you enjoy. Okay, when we talk about vector analysis for a particular particle, we're going to talk about uh, uh, many particles later. Uh, we talk about uh, rectilinear coordinates, axes oriented in fixed directions, and those directions aren't particularly related to the motion. Uh, Cartesian coordinates, in other words. We'll also talk about curvilinear coordinates axes that happen to be oriented with regard to particle path. So as the, you have a particular particle, uh, say an airplane, if it changes direction, the direction of the coordinates also changes. If we define a unit vector as e hat i, which is defined in the ith direction, all right, so the hat represents a unit, and we'll use e in this particular course. Some books use u. Notice that, it's that I tried to write it in bold. So e hat i is just a unit vector in the ith direction. Let's pick three, say e1, e2, and e3. And if we say that e sub i, where i is 1, 2, or 3, cross e sub j is, again, 1, 2, or 3, it's equal to this function, epsilon sub i, j, k, e hat k, where this e sub i, j, k is equal to 1 if i, j, k is either one of the lists 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 1, or 3, 1, 2. Eijk is equal to minus 1 if Ijk is given by 1, 3, 2, 2, 1, 3, or 3, 2, 1. If you look carefully, you notice that these are permutations of the same list. So if you have 1, 2, 3, well, there's 2, 3, here's 2, 3, and we move the 1 around to the end, so the 1 goes around to the end. And furthermore, then if we move the 2 around to the end, then we have 3, 1, 2. These are just permutations of each other. Furthermore, the minus one, you notice that we actually switch one of the numbers in order. So here we have put the three in between the one and the two, and that changes the sign of this epsilon. And do a similar thing with these two. The idea really is, is that we're just talking about the cross product. And you're able actually to define cross products of unit vectors, cross products of real vectors, in what's called component notation where everything is written in uh, another way of saying it is in tensor notation, tensor component notation. And this is called a Levitz-Civetta tensor. Okay. Epsilon IJK is called the Levitz-Civetta tensor. If any of the two indices are repeated, you notice that here we have no repetition, so I and J and K are never equal to each other. If indeed they are equal to each other, then epsilon sub i j k is equal to zero. So for example, epsilon sub one 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 is equal to zero as one epsilon sub one one two would be equal to zero and so forth. The set E one, E two, E three, so it's said to be mutually orthogonal, 
and right-handed if we define everything in this way. And for the remainder of this course, that's what we'll do. What it means to say when what does it mean to say when we're saying everything is right-handed? Take your right hand and point your thumb, first finger, and middle finger in the shape of like if you're grabbing the corner of a box. The idea is your thumb points up, your first finger points forward, and your middle finger points to the left on your right hand. What you end up forming is is a set of unit vectors, E1 for your thumb, E2 for your first finger, and E3 for your middle finger. These fingers end up being mutually orthogonal. They must be because of the cross product definition here. Okay. There's another thing we can use, it's called a triad trick. Uh, it works for any orthogonal set of unit vectors, not just say 1, 2, 3, or x, y, z, or uh, just limited situations like that. It also works for uh, cylindrical coordinate systems and spherical coordinate systems, and it's a very useful thing to remember. Notice that if we take the cross product of e sub 1 with e sub 2, e sub 1 cross e sub 2, that's going to be equal to e sub 3. e sub 3 cross e sub 1, that's e sub 2. Notice how it goes on the right hand side. E sub, e sub 3 cross E sub 1 again is E sub 2. If we go in the opposite direction, E sub 2 cross E sub 1, that's minus E sub 3. We're going against the, the direction. We're going counterclockwise. E sub 3 cross E sub 2, that's minus E sub 1. So if you write your vectors in that way, then it allows you to define uh, the cross products in, in a very simple manner. Let's talk about how a particle moves with respect to fixed frames. A fixed or inertial frame uh, coordinate is system is a coordinate system that is not rotating and either has a fixed origin or an origin moving at a constant velocity. So if we look at this frame and we'll say that O, X, Y, Z, all of them capital letters, so O, X, Y, Z here, is a fixed frame, or in other words, an inertial frame. And this coordinate system is, is not rotating and uh, it may, if it's moving, it's not accelerating. It's moving either at a constant velocity or it's, it's completely still. And we'll define a vector from the origin and we'll say that's a vector of uh, position P, point P, and R is the vector from the origin to that particular point right, along as the point moves along C, C prime. In the coordinate system, cap O, cap X, cap Y, cap Z, R is equal to X, E sub X, plus Y, E sub Y, Z, E sub Z. And these e sub x, e sub y, and e sub z, these are the Cartesian unit vectors, and they're the general forms of i, j, k that you might have seen earlier. The reason we write them this way is that the e is really just a unit vector in a particular direction defined by the subscript. i, j, k is not quite so general. And in fact, for a lot of problems, we'll use a lot more than just three unit vectors out of convenience. If v is a velocity vector, then v is equal to the time derivative of r. So v is equal to x dot ex plus y dot e sub y plus z dot e sub z, z, where this dot above the variable represents the time derivative. This only works for inertial or fixed frames. The reason is, is that if we have an accelerating frame or the directions of these unit vectors is changing, say the coordinate system itself is rotating, then there will be a time derivative for each of these. And in this case, we're ignoring that. We're saying it doesn't exist, and so this is only valid for inertial or fixed frames. The acceleration, then we just take another derivative, and we get the second derivative with respect to time of the position vector. And again, this is only works in the fixed or inertial frame system. If the frame is an inertia, wasn't inertial, then e hex e x uh, hat dot e y hat dot, and uh, would be, and this should be e hat z dot. All of these wouldn't be equal to zero. So our acceleration can be written like this for fixed inertial frame system. X double dot E sub X, Y double dot E sub Y, Z double dot E sub Z. Now if we talk about taking coordinate axis derivatives, I'm going to show you a particular way to think about it. And the book shows a different way. So if you don't like the way I show it to you, then you can use Hain Burrow's uh, method. And if you get used to the method that I use, I hope that you find it easier than the book's method. So let's take a look here. Suppose we have a particle P, and it's rotating or moving about an axis in a circle defined by, by this, uh, the axis here, B, B prime is shown. So it's just basically going around in a circle 
all right, and with defined by this axis. Is the infinitesimal angular uh, displacement, okay, so we're saying it's a very small displacement from point uh, P prime to P double prime. So as this point P moves from P prime to P double prime, that's an angular distance of delta theta, all right, and that's doing that in a time delta T. And we're talking about the infinitesimal nature of it. Why are we talking about infinitesimal? The assumption is, is that this motion is about an axis. And what might happen is, if you have a real point that's moving along the path, perhaps just after this moment, it changes and goes in another direction. And so we'd have to change our axis. So for this moment in time, when it goes from P prime to P double prime, it's about this particular axis that we're defining right now, B, B prime. Maybe a moment later, it would be about a totally different axis because the direction is changing. So for this split second in time, we're talking about the motion about this particular axis along the, and along the curved path. And this axis is said to be an instantaneous axis. The angular velocity of this point about that particular axis, we could say it's omega. And we t as the idea is, is if we take the limit as delta t goes to zero of this delta theta, delta t, is that point p goes from p prime to p double prime around this instantaneous axis, we could say that this omega is given by theta dot. Yeah. One thing to notice is, is that this omega will be parallel to delta theta, right? or in other words, parallel to theta dot. The idea is, is that one thing to remember is, when we're talking about rotation vectors, that this omega is along the axis perpendicular to the motion of the particle. All right, so it's along B, B prime for this moment in time. So if we say B perhaps is fixed to the origin of an inertial coordinate system, cap O, cap X, cap Y, cap Z, and this is a fixed system, or inertial again, the velocity of this particular point, okay, as this particle is going around this particular axis, is given by R dot. So if we define a position vector out to this point P, as it goes from P prime to P double prime, this R vector, just the velocity vector, then becomes R dot, or in other words, omega, right, this velocity vector, an angular velocity vector, cross R. So you might be used to writing it this way, omega R sine theta, where this uh, sine phi, where this phi represents that cross. And the phi is the angle between omega and the, the vector R, as shown here. You can see that theta F phi here. So it's between omega and R. Okay. And it happens to be along a unit vector given by B, B prime, this, this axis. Notice that how we use E, B, B prime, and we didn't use E sub X, E sub Y, E sub Z, or E sub 1, E sub 2, E sub 3. We write in here whatever direction we happen to want to use for this unit vector. So this unit vector actually represents the unit vector along B, B prime. Here, when we write R, what we're talking about is the length of the, of the, of the R vector, and this is a convenient way to write it, square root of R dot R. If we look at the acceleration from this, then the acceleration is just the time derivative of this velocity vector. In other words, it's the time, the velocity, the time derivative of omega cross r okay, plus omega cross r dot. Remember, when you take a time derivative, it's distributive across the cross product. So time derivative of a cross product is the time derivative of the first thing, cross product with the second thing, plus the first thing, cross product with the time derivative of the second thing. Well, that ends up being the first thing. Not much that we can do with that. That all that is is just says that if the particle p is moving along this path, if it accelerates along that path, then that increases, that causes an angular acceleration. That we multiply by r. The other one is omega cross omega cross r, right. and that one is the centripetal acceleration. That's because the path, the direction of point p, is changing from where it was back here at p prime where it has moved to in P double prime. So its motion has changed directions. The first term here is the tangential acceleration, or acceleration as the particle moves along the path. And the centripetal acceleration is the acceleration due to the change, direction, change in direction of the path, respectively.
Okay, now that we've talked about that, let's talk about the derivatives of the unit vectors. So we're going to define a, an omega vector here, and then we'll have e sub 1, e sub 2, e sub 3. And this e sub 1, e sub 2, e sub 3 won't be associated with our inertial frame. Inertial frame. O, cap O, cap X, cap Y, cap Z. All right, but we'll draw everything from the origin here just out of convenience. So we can say that e sub x is a vector just like r, so it stands to reason then that if we say e sub x is equal to omega, e sub x dot, it should have a dot here, sorry, is equal to omega cross e sub x dot. In fact, a unit vector in any direction, I'm sorry, this should be e sub x dot. This should be e sub x dot equals omega cross e sub x. So there should be no dot here, and there should be a dot here. In fact, a unit vector in any direction e sub e sub uh, e hat sub i has a velocity e sub hat i dot, which is equal to omega cross e sub i. So let's take a look here. If we pick three orthogonal unit vectors, e sub one, e sub two, e sub three, they're rotating around as defined by omega. So in this picture, we have uh, e sub 1, e sub 2, e sub 3, and they're, they're rotating around this axis defined by omega, and the speed at which they're rotating is defined by the length of omega, right, the angular velocity, omega, which is magnitude of this vector, and the direction, again, is, is about this axis direction, like our b, b prime, like we had before. So if we have that situation, then e sub 1 dot is equal to omega cross e sub 1, e sub 2 dot is equal to omega cross e sub 2, and then e sub 3 dot is equal to omega cross e sub 3. And since omega just happens to be a vector 2, we can write uh, just a general vector, omega, say, the omega itself is equal to omega x e sub x plus omega y e sub y plus omega z e sub z, or we can write it in terms of omega e sub 1, e sub 2, and e sub 3. Notice that all we're doing is we're just changing the unit vectors. Each of these unit vectors, e sub x, e sub y, e sub z, are orthogonal with respect to each other, as is e sub 1, e sub 2, e sub 3. And this omega x and omega 1, they'll be different values because these directions are different. Okay, So right, omega x will not be equal to omega 1, neither will omega y be equal to omega 2, and omega z will not be equal to omega 3 in general. With that being said, then the second equation lets us find that all right, e sub 1 dot is equal to omega cross e sub 1. Well, that's if we substitute in for omega here, then we can see that we have omega 1, e sub 1 cross 1 cross plus omega 2, e sub 2 cross e sub 1, plus omega 3, e sub 3 cross e sub 1. Anybody remember what uh, e sub 1 cross e sub 1 is? If you have e any vector cross with itself happens to be? What about these two? Can we find them? Of course, anything cross product in itself is equal to zero, so this first term falls out, and these two terms then r remain behind. Let's use this, the that rule that we were showing before: e sub two cross e sub one and e sub three cross e sub one will be easy to find that way. So if we look at it, we have one, two, three, and we use this right-hand rule: e sub two cross e sub one, e sub two cross e sub one. It goes counterclockwise, so it's minus e sub three, and then e sub three cross e sub one e sub 3 cross e sub 1 gives us e sub 2, so it follows along with the direction. So e sub 1 dot is equal to omega 1 times 0, remember we had e sub 1 cross e sub 1, minus omega 2 e sub 3 plus omega 3 e sub 2. So in other words, omega 3 e sub 2 minus omega 2 e sub 3. Similarly, we get e sub 2 dot is equal to omega 1 e sub 3 minus omega 3 e sub 1, and omega 3 dot is equal to omega 2 e sub 1 minus omega 1 e sub 2. Okay. All of this works if we have a, a vector omega that tells us how the, the unit vectors are rotating. That's the only reason that this works. So we need an omega for all this to happen.